This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to everyone who helps us make this show possible, including DeGrasse Daniels, Erwin Sturr, and Ken Hayes. Coming up on DTNS, why 2024 will change streaming TV forever. Plus, Spotify lets you exclude playlists from its algorithm and a way to diagnose diseases you didn't even know to look for. No, it's not weather. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, February 9th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining me, the host of World's Greatest Con, Brian Brushwood. Oh my goodness, it's fun to finally get to talk to you, Tom Merritt. I know. I, I, I'm an admirer of the show, World's Greatest Con. I can't wait for the next season of it. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, man, likewise, I love your insights, however wrong and differing with mine they are on <laughs> Cord Killers. Oh, right. There's also that. Uh, let's, uh, we'll tell you more about that in a moment. But first, the quick hits. Twitter has gone back and forth on access to its API. Here's the latest, as posted by the Twitter dev account. Free access to the Twitter API has been extended through February 13th. They didn't say whether it had anything to do with any of the bugs yesterday. At that point, February 13th, there will be some basic access available for $100 a month. Free access will continue. It was They weren't going to do any at all, but now it will continue. But it'll be very limited, 1,500 tweets per month for a single authenticated user token. Uh, Twitter has faced too many bugs to mention over the past couple of days or so, uh, including the fact that the Twitter developer forum website is now behind a login prompt. So if a developer would like more details on these new policies, uh, they can't. They, they, most developers say they can't get into that login. Uh, so we're hoping they clear that up. To finish on a more positive note, though, Twitter Blue subscribers can now post up to 4,000 characters. And if you're worried about seeing that cluttering up your feed, uh, content past 280 characters will be behind a little show more link. Meta officially closed on its acquisition of Within, developer of the VR fitness app Supernatural. Now, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission had sued to block the deal back in July, saying the move was anti-competitive. But federal judge Edward Davila ruled earlier this month that the deal could proceed. So a big test, perhaps, of uh, the FTC's uh, more uh, uh, stringent uh, uh, policies on tech uh, kind of tested here in the courtroom. The judge did give the FTC a week to appeal the ruling, but that doesn't appear to have happened. Not all AI is chat GPT. You'd be excused for, for thinking that. In fact, not all AI is even uh, based on a large language model. Microsoft and American Express, for instance, announced a deal to use machine learning to automate expense reports and approvals. This is not even related to Microsoft's AI uh, partnership with OpenAI. It uses Microsoft Cloud tools. Employees will be able to take a photo of a receipt and then the system will either give it a red, yellow, or green score based on the score the expense might be automatically approved. I assume if you get green, it just, you're done. Now you've filed your expense report. It's that easy. Anything else would be held for review. Microsoft will be the first user of the system. They're going to dog food this themselves for its own internal expenses. If you don't file expense reports often, this may not excite you. But if you know, you know. The U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, a.k.a. if you're friends, you can call it NIST, announced that the ASCON family of encryption algorithms were designated as a standard for lightweight cryptography applications. These types of encryption standards are needed for Internet of Things devices, which often don't have the power to run standard computer encryption algorithms, at least without a healthy performance set. Think of things like industrial sensors, healthcare devices, or even critical infrastructure. Uh, these low-power devices can implement ASCON encryption, which includes key countermeasures against side channel attacks and support for hashing. Available implementations include C, Java, Python, and Rust. NIST launched a program for IoT encryption standards back in 2019, and it looked at 57 proposals deciding on ASCON. Amazon's Project Kuiper is one of several attempts to compete with Starlink and OneWeb for providing satellite-based internet service, and uh, they made a big step. Project Kuiper got approval for its Orbital Debris Mitigation Program, which will allow it to begin its plans to launch 3,256 satellites into orbit. 
All right, this is this is my big prediction. Streaming platforms are about to enter their consolidation phase. All the major players are getting ready for that to happen, but I don't think it's going to start happening until 2024. Let's explain. Starting with the latest moves by Disney. Now, you probably heard about the Disney earnings report. Maybe you didn't. Uh, if you did, yes, Disney Plus did lose subscribers overall last quarter uh, because it lost wildly popular Indian Premier League cricket. Uh, but outside of India and Southeast Asia, Disney gained streaming subscribers, including at Hulu, which gained 800,000 subscribers. Overall, Disney revenue and profits rose. What's more interesting than those figures, though, is how it's changing, Rich. Yeah, Disney reorganized into three main business segments. There's Disney Parks, Experiences, and Products, Disney Entertainment, and Q Raised Eyebrows, ESPN. Mm -hmm. Before you go jump to any conclusions about Disney selling ESPN, Disney CEO Bob Iger said, but we're not engaged in any conversations right now or considering a spinoff of ESPN. He also said ESPN will become a streaming first business. ESPN Plus grew to 24.9 million subscribers. So Tom, what is it preparing for? Yeah, if you think you have too many streaming choices now, uh, you may not think that after 2024. Here are the dates. January 2024 is when the agreement where Disney bought most of Fox will force either Comcast or Disney to force the sale of Comcast 33% stake in Hulu. Comcast can execute it. Disney can execute it. Uh, Comcast has even said it might be interested in buying out Disney's 77% stake. Instead, they'd have to change the agreement to do that, but they could. Until now, Comcast's position on that has seemed a little bit like a bargaining tactic to, you know, maybe try to get a little bit of a better deal before that January date. However, Thursday on CNBC, Disney CEO Bob Iger said, everything is on the table right now. So I am not going to speculate whether we are a buyer or a seller of Hulu, but I obviously have suggested that I'm concerned about undifferentiated general entertainment, particularly in the competitive landscape that we are operating in, and we are going to look at it very objectively and expansively. In other words, what he said was either Hulu finds a lucrative niche or he might just sell it. Also keep in mind this other date. The merger of Warner Brothers and Discovery precluded any negotiations that would result in a sale until April 2024. In April 2024, negotiations could begin. And lots of people think Comcast might be interested in snapping up Warner Brothers Discovery once it's available. So, Brian, now that we've set the table for everyone here... What is your best guess for what happens to Hulu, ESPN, HBO Max, Discovery Plus at all? Uh, I've, I've gotten out of the business of predicting what will actually happen, but I am an expert in what I hope will happen. And uh, first of all, one point of clarification in January 2024, is that something that must happen? One side must sell to the other or something that either side can trigger if they good, want? That's a good point. At, at once January 2024 happens, either one can make it happen. If both of them hold their fire, it could it could continue as it is for as long as neither one of them pull the trigger. But at any point, one of them can say, yeah, no, you got to sell. So right now, Disney Plus is doing very, very well. And uh, full disclosure, I have a program that just joined the Disney Plus family. If you go to the National Geographic tab, you'll find a show called Hacking the System. Uh, but I really like Disney Plus's strategy of the five pillars that seem to cater to various age groups and demographics within their own environment. However, I also, if there's one thing I love even more than that, it's the idea of Hulu and FX Plus content eventually becoming secret adult Disney. Uh, I, I don't know whether or not they'll do it, though. I think Bob Iger was doing a little bit of... Uh, code talking when he said that he's not a fan of generalized entertainment. And I think that's a very astute thing on his part. So what I hope happens is that one year from now, we're looking at a reality where pretty much Hulu is adult Disney, uh, ABC content, ESPN content, and Disney plus is family Disney. It feels like they are positioning ESPN to be entirely separate. You, you either survive on your own or we've got you walled off from everything else and we can de determine what to do with you. But I, yeah, Hulu could either become the, uh, what, what, what's, is it Searchlight? Is that the one? What's uh, the uh, Touchstone. 
touchstone. It, it become the touchstone of Disney streaming. And, and to be honest, or, that, that, or they just the sell it off to Comcast. Of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Rich, what about you? So the interesting thing about ESPN right now is uh, I know they have their NBA negotiations coming up, but right now they seem to do a a little of a lot of sports, but not a lot of any one sport. And we're seeing deals getting done. We're streaming provider, you know, NFL rights are are, are you know being carted out. Uh, Major League Soccer rights. I know that's a you know it's a smaller uh, sport, but still significant going to Apple and that kind of stuff. I, I wonder if in those basketball negotiations, like if ESPN becomes the, the streaming home of basketball or something like that, it's going to become a streaming first service. I, you know, to your point, Tom, about being kind of kept entirely separate. I wonder if this is getting set up so that maybe if Disney uh, uh, entertainment, possibly, I know we've heard some talk about Apple being pretty the only buyer that could afford it, but looking to do something like that and not maybe having sports separated off significantly lowers the price and maybe makes that an easier uh, uh, acquisition to pull off. I know that would be like the deal of deals uh, at that point. Uh, but like that, that whole separation of, of that business into all of these very distinct parts that all have their own unique monetization and all could kind of be spun off is, uh, is super interesting to me. Yeah, ESPN has all of the NHL in the U S okay. uh, but only on ESPN plus. ESPN plus has a lot of stuff like that. So, uh, I, I think, I think it's an interesting thought to say if Apple were to want to acquire Disney entertainment, they might not want to acquire ESPN. Uh, and so we'll put it over there because the other thing he said, even though they do have NHL is they are not going to spend as much for rights as they have been. Iger, Iger very much indicated that. My, my other question is, as a consumer, I know we've kind of hit this point where, oh, another streaming, another plus streaming service. Oh, another ad supported streaming services where uh, up until a certain point, streaming services were a vehicle of delight. If I'm a if I'm a consumer here looking at a more consolidated streaming landscape in 2024, what am I excited for? I guess I'd like that. Uh I would say you're excited for the bloodbath of everybody destroying their brands. I mean, we, we, we posted an episode of Court Killers on Monday and the news was irrelevant by Tuesday. <laughs> That's how quick <laughs> everybody is slaughtering each oh, other. Always happens to us. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think what you would be excited for is a, an easier choice. Right now, everyone complains there's too many of these things. My prediction is by 2025, you won't have too many of them. You'll be complaining that there's too much consolidation. I'm going to guess there's three or four main platforms that are similar to Netflix, Peacock, uh, at Disney Plus, etc. And then there'll be a bunch of niche ones like Shudder, the Brit Box, that sort of thing. And and I think Disney's trying to decide, is Hulu going to become a shutter, a, a, a sort of a niche service mm -hmm. uh, of things, or, or should we just get rid of it and, and, and let somebody buy it and fold it in, into something else? Uh, also worth paying attention to is the specific language about ESPN's increased focus on streaming entertainment. One mm. of the long standing in the 12 year history of the show Tom and I have done, we've talked about the intractable long term agreements that tied sports to certain broadcast markets, to certain cable markets, to certain providers, and ESPN has just had their hands tied. And I what it feels like is five or six years ago, they got wise that every time they renewed, they gave priority for ESPN to say, hey, we have the rights to do whatever we want with this, whether it's on cable, on broadcast, or on a streaming service. And now, only now, are, are they mostly extracted from most of those agreements from half a decade ago? And now they can make bold moves. Yeah. And ESPN plus, uh, NBA and NFL particularly accepted, uh, MLB go, probably going to go somewhere else. They, they could be everything else. They have Canadian football league. They have a bunch of college conferences. They have NHL, uh, that could be the future of ESPN, which is not that there is an ESPN, but that there's an ESPN app and there will always be something that is a sport that someone wants to watch uh, at, at any given time of day, which was always the dream of ESPN is to always have, have something available. Well, the wall street journals, Ron Winslow has an article on something called metagenomic next generation sequencing that promises to be much better at diagnosing illnesses than many current tests. Tom, let's get some background, a little detail on this. Yeah. Let's back up a second. Uh, 
right now, if something unusual is wrong with you, your doctor is going to make uh, their best guess based on your symptoms and history, then order a test to look for what she thinks is the most likely cause. Now, if that test is negative, you got to do that whole thing over again and be like, okay, what's the next most likely thing? Ruling out the possibilities. This new method does not require you to have any idea what's wrong. Let's say you have inflammation of the brain and you don't know why. You take a small sample, you sequence all the DNA in that sample, uh, so you get all the patterns, the A, C, G, T, etc., and then a computer looks through and it eliminates all the stuff that you know is human because we've mapped the human DNA. That leaves you with maybe 1% of the material, and you can screen that against everything stored in a database of other non-human genetic material. In fact, the U.S. National Institute of Health has one that's being used called GenBank. Doesn't matter whether it's a fungus or a worm or a bacteria, a virus, you don't have to know what you're looking for, but you can see what it matches to. And if you get a match, that may be a thing you never would have thought to test for. And there are a couple of things in this Wall Street Journal article of actual cases where that turned out to be the case. All right, that's the good news. It's not perfect though, Rich. What are the limitations? Yeah, so because it returns all results, some results may be things that are dormant or otherwise irrelevant. So you're going to get like a larger list that definitely is going to need some interpreting, uh, not just something you could just, you know, have the printout uh, right to a consumer. It also can still miss pathogens, including pathogens that may not be missed by more traditional targeted tests. So it's not a one-stop shop, but definitely part of a toolkit. It also costs $2,000 per test, and the Wall Street Journal calls insurance coverage spotty. Yeah, not Spotify. That's a, that's a, a <laughs> that's later like story. Um, so, 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 Brian, this, this seems like good news. It seems like it's a test that that can catch a lot of things, but you, you're still going to need a doctor. It's not something you're going to do at home. Yeah, and objectively, this is more precision. This is more data, and it's more directed data. And objectively, all of these are good. But being a magician, I'm tuned into the subjective because subjectively, I saw a lot of people get genetic screenings and have freaked out and made incredible uh, medical decisions about their body. Uh, it makes me think of uh, uh, Angelina Jolie getting a double mastectomy because she was genetically more likely to develop breast, breast cancer eventually. It, 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 I wonder if humans are going to pay for this type of service and overreact or at least panic or reduce their own personal quality of life. For example, uh, you know, we've seen screening procedures, uh, advised screening procedures change over time yeah, because yeah. eventually all men, if you live long enough, are going to get some kind of prostate cancer. And so there, there have been changes about that. And that's the stuff I worry about. Yeah, that, that is an important question. How often are these dormant things showing up? And this Wall Street Journal article did not shed light on it. If it's 10%, that's a lot. If it's like, oh, 0.05%, then the doctor's informed nature of your case probably is going to keep false positives from happening. But it's important to know that. Um, and, and it's, it's important to know that this is not like a, a, a thing that is scanning your genome or a service you sign up to, to scan your genome. This is something a doctor is going to order from, from a lab. Like they're, they're doing this at UCSF right now. But what's exciting about this for me is I have known people in my family that have had symptoms of stuff for years and have dreaded, like, I'm going to go to a doctor and I'm just going to go on this endless, uh, procession of see a, a specialist, get this test. It's yeah. not that. So go back to the prime, you know, like you, there's this, there's this, just this dreadful. And even if you have insurance going through the medical system like that, you just be soul crushing to the point where you're like, I, I'm almost would, I don't want to know where you, you get into this very negative mindset in the spiral. And if you can have one test that even if it has limitations, even if it does need to be carefully mediated uh, by a medical professional, like the possibility of disrupting that extremely time consuming, extremely expensive and, if these results, you know, uh, uh, check out and are, and are available, like re reduces expense, even $2,000 is not expensive, but add in all those tests to get to yeah, where you need to it go. A bunch. Yeah. That, that to me, like speaks to me very personally. Uh, so I, I could definitely see, I, I'm hopeful that this can get expanded. We can get a uh, uh, kind of broader um, capacity. I know um, the, you know, University of California at San Francisco, they do 50 samples a week. So obviously capacity needs to get up uh, on this, um, but definitely something I'm excited to see more of. Yeah. And and don't forget, this is not the first test you're going to get. This is when yes. the doctor is like, man, I just don't know what this could be. Uh, mm -hmm. Then then you can you can turn to this. your doctor house moment. <laughs> uh, 
join in the conversation in our Discord uh, of all your symptoms. No, don't do not do that. But you can talk about all the technology you want. Uh, join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, playlists are the lifeblood of any music streaming service, and Spotify definitely retains customers through things like their Discoverer Weekly or their Blend playlist, other algorithmically generated playlists. They're good at that. It's their business. But having a broad algorithmic brush based on all of your listening habits can make these a little less effective. You know, people want to listen to different music, you know, when they're doing things like working out or, hey, you're hanging out with your kids, then, you know, if you're going to be headed off to sleep or get some work done at your PC, uh, it, it just is different use cases. And you don't maybe want that all melded together. To solve that problem, Spotify launched a new feature called Exclude from your taste profile. As you might expect, that lets you exclude things from your taste profile. <laughs> uh, so, so you pick specific playlists uh, and you can say, don't let these affect my recommendations. Uh, and once you pick a playlist, that affects your past listens. It takes those out too, not just anything you'd listen to in the future. Uh, if you change your mind, you can always say, you know what, put this playlist back into my recommendations. And again, retroactive, it works. It also keeps them out of your, your end Spotify wrapped list. Uh, it's rolling out to the web, desktop, iOS, and Android starting right now. Uh, if you like listen to white noise before you go to sleep and white noise keeps showing up in your recommended list, obvious use case for this sort of thing, but we've seen this kind of algorithmic exclusion before. Uh, there's the, you know, don't show me these kinds of ads things. I've seen those on Facebook. Uh, I think there's something like that on, on YouTube. Uh, there's the idea of creating your, your burner Instagram account, uh, so that, so that you can do things that the algorithm isn't going to, uh, do to affect your main account. Uh, just using incognito windows in a browser so you can search for something and, and not affect the products that show up in, in your Google searches normally. Brian, this seems like a lot of work, but why do we have to be the ones to do that? Well, because we're 20 minutes away from AI bots having a conversation with us because ultimately, I'm in as soon as, I don't know, a year, Spotify is going to say, what kind of music do you want right now? And I'm going to say, well, I'm on the exercise bicycle. I go about this many beats per minute. So I want something with no words. So I'm not distracted and I could read articles while I'm moving at roughly this rate. And that'll be something it'll understand and give me the appropriate techno music for. But as a middle step, and this mm. is a little bit of a magician's trick. Um, there's a clothing company that you subscribe to and they don't ask you what kind of clothes you like. They say, which of the following brands would you never be caught dead in? And then, and then they're like, what about this? Which of these do you hate? And it, and, and it never asks you what you want. It does ask you roughly what size, is, what shape is your body and so on. And then you end up admitting to things that you never would have consciously selected from a menu. This is also used in uh, various statistical surveys where uh, let's say there's a sexual activity they, they, that nobody wants to cop to. So they'll say, here are 10. How? Give me a number of these that you've engaged in. Here's another 10. Give me another number. And then basically they do the math and they figure out which ones you've done and you've never actually admitted to anything. Uh, I think I think this is a wonderful addition to it. Uh, I, I don't necessarily love the proactive trolley problem moment of saying, I hate this, never do this again. Uh, I would just, I, I would think they would build this into a skip feature, like just read between the lines. If I'm skipping it, but, but then most it, likely not, I don't like it. Yeah, I guess. I, 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 that's sort of where I'm going, which is I understand like, oh, I have a kid's playlist on my Spotify list. I don't want that showing up in my recommendations. This gives me a way to go like this, exclude this. This isn't really me. But but where you're going is 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 where I, I, I think I would like to be, which is there, there ought to be other passive ways that these tools could figure that out without me having to manually curate it. There, there is, but also as the parent who has Casper baby pants and like Disney show tunes like popping up when I'm, you know, I'm just trying to listen to my La Tigra, like it, it makes me like I, I'm, I'm all for this because I know exactly where that playlist is. Like it would be one thing if this was, uh, you know, skipping over like an algorithmically generated playlist, like oh, this just isn't my speed. Yes, I do want it to learn from that where it's new music, but I know exactly where this or the white noise or or like my workout playlist is coming from. So there's no chance that I'm going to like block mm -hmm. this incorrectly. The one thing I'll say is YouTube music doesn't have this. And as I've said, it is frustrating, but they do also offer like just more targeted, like they kind of just 
lump you together in different genres in different playlists. That's like one of their algorithms that generate playlists. I'm assuming Spotify has the same thing. And to me, if I want to make sure it's just like, I got an hour away from the kids. I just want my music. That's usually like kind of what I dip into. So I also don't know unless you really need, like, I want my whole library excluding these playlists. Like, I, I feel like the need is, is there in a lot of ways. Like you, I don't, you know, it's, it's not the biggest problem. It, it, it introduces a problem that I had never considered before, which is I had never paused to consider whether or not I should think of Spotify as trustworthy. Uh, I do think of iOS and my Apple device as trustworthy, which is why I don't mind the fact that despite never telling it where I work, never telling it where I go to lunch on Mondays, never telling it that we do cord killers Monday evening or whatever, iOS just pops up and says, yeah, it seems like you probably want to head out. Traffic's light. And it, it has figured out all of those things. And I don't mind it because Apple has a good reputation for keeping that information private. I don't know what Spotify's reputation is. And, but meanwhile, you know, there's certain music I want when I'm sitting with my wife. There's other music when I'm about to go into a show and probably want to get pumped up and listen to old school hip hop or what have you. Um, <laughs> it, it's uh, I, 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 privacy concerns, I think, are going to be the second wave of this kind of thing. Yeah, I, that's where my head was going to is like control, control over your data. This is going to make it even more important. The the more of this kind of thing, and the more that that tools like Chat GPT can say, like, "Hey, if you let us know something about you, we you won't have to curate these playlists. We'll know. Oh, he obviously has kids. That's his kids' playlist. We're not going to put that in the recommendations. But you need to trust who you're giving that kind of information to." U.S. listeners likely think networking gear when they think of the name TP Link. But in Asia, it also offers a full line of robot vacuums under its Tapo, Tapo RV brand. Well, it's starting to expand that brand's availability to North American chores available now on Amazon and shipping February 13th. These compete on the budget end of the market, price similar to brands like Eufy and Yeedy. The Tapo RV10 Lite comes in at $230, offers an 800 millimeter bin that should go about two weeks before entering. That's pretty big uh, by robot vacuum standards. The standard Tapo RV10 costs $20 more and offers a smaller bin, but it can also mop your floors with a 300 milliliter reservoir as well. Don't expect niceties like LiDAR though for the price, uh, but both offer three hours of runtime and support Amazon and Google voice assistance. So some nice features there. Sadly, the self-emptying RV10 Plus isn't available in the U.S. for now. The Tom, are you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just, I want, I know, not only want a TP Link uh, vacuum, I, I would like a Netgear vacuum and a Western Digital vacuum and all my networking products uh, as vacuums. That That's the part that, that caught me about this. It's just the, <laughs> the brand drift there. I, I do. It is interesting. You know, we've seen certainly some privacy concerns uh, over uh, Eufy, uh, obviously with a different product line uh, for them. I do wonder if there is a, a case to me. It's like, hey, TP Link, you already trust us with all your your network yeah. secure. You know, your networking stuff. Your vacuum. We've seen privacy concerns <laughs> we're, we're about all, smart vacuums before. So we're already I, like, sucking up all your data. Yeah. Why not let us <laughs> suck up your, up your DNA data, yeah. off the floor. <laughs> yeah, and then you use it for some metagenomics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, that's not going to sound so crazy five, ten years no, from now. No, it's not. Yeah. And then ChatGPT will pick uh, what show you want to watch on Disney Plus Hulu. <laughs> All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Matt wrote in with a question on the implications of AI-based search. He said, as I understand, current search like Google, Bing, et cetera, doesn't create content. It simply displays it based on what data the algorithms can access. Each may extrapolate search terms to provide answers, but they are all accessing and answering using a defined, albeit supermassive, set of data. So yeah, when, when Google has those little questions and answers, the answers are always just snippets. They're, they're excerpts from pages that exist. In general, Matt asks, would AI-based search answers be available exclusively to those companies and not accessible to other search engines, thus serving as the basis of proprietary internets? Uh, he gave this example. If Bard was asked a question like, what is the most compelling reason to listen to the Daily Tech News show? It generates a new and unique data point that I assume only Google or Alphabet would have access to. I've always just thought about this as a, as a chat, as an ephemeral answer, especially because ChatGPT as it is now might give you a different answer if you ask the same question a few minutes later. But he, this is an interesting point. As these answers get better and better, do are the answers copyrighted? 
are the answers part of the emerging data set? And uh, one of the yeah. first things that somebody asked me when I showed them Dolly, uh, they said, wait, so these are available on the internet. And I was like, yeah. And then, and you could tag them whatever you want. And it's like, yeah, it's like, so don't these become part of the data set for the next generation of well, AI painters? And like, at some point, do we end up with, what was that, that terrible redrawing of, of Jesus? <laughs> like, do, do we end up with just a pair of eyes and a pancake face? <laughs> Yeah, as we're seeing these, uh, you know, Microsoft was talking about the networks train on themselves. So as they're getting more outputs like that, uh, yeah, because I, I originally kind of talked about the same kind of point you had. Whereas, if they're they're all scraping the same web index, like theoretically, yes, there's algorithmic differences of how it's going to, or, or there's systemic differences of how it's going to have an output. But like the source theoretically is roughly the same. But yeah, as they start training on themselves, probably yeah, I. Good point, uh, Matt. Really, really good point. The answers won't go into the training index. Okay. Because they're not constantly training on the index. They are training on themselves in the sense of they evaluate how people responded to the answers. They don't like throw their own okay. answers back into their own data set. So I, I, I don't know if I'm missing anything, but I think that prevents them from just turning into pancake, everything into pancake well, face. And, uh, uh, At least I hope is, so. That is assuming good faith, everybody knowing what is generated and what is not. And uh, for example, let's say we're already seeing the emergence of some bad acting AIs that are not giving the signatures that they're AI generated. So so those could sure. be passed off. Uh, for, for example, you know, we got the story of, of CNET publishing a number, number of articles that seem to be written by humans, but we're not. They were always attributed. People just didn't like you have to click to see it. Uh, right. I feel like that was a little exaggerated, but they weren't very good articles. I think that was the bigger story there. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, yes, you have to make sure that the data set they're training on is pure. I'm not sure how much of a risk it is that there could be an attack that says, oh, let's slip a bunch of AI made data out there that they won't be able to tell is AI made data. Well, well let, let me throw a little bit of a curveball. Yeah, let's yeah, take yeah. like the AP style guide. That is an artificial construct that has affected the way people have written for decades, <laughs> for hundreds of years, right? And so this is an arbitrary, uh, uh, you know, topspin that's been placed on that has affected language across the board. So likewise, I assume AI will affect human language in much the similar way. Yeah, that that I think that is an even uh, that is a, a better effect than like oh it's going to train on itself. But but is it, it how it it affects this computer up here in my head? Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a really good thought. Uh, well, you know what, Brian Brushwood is full of really good thoughts, and you can find them all over the internet. Brian, where can people find more of your thoughts? Every single Monday, you and I talk about how to watch what you want, when you want, on whatever dang device you please at cordkillers.com. Please join us. It's a fantastic program. But... We are rounding the corner. We are 90 to 95% complete on season three of World's Greatest Con, and it is a barn burner. I am so excited about this season. If you ain't heard nothing I've ever done ever, please just give it a start right from the first episode. It's only maybe seven hours of listening, but but they're basically high-quality production audiobooks. I think you'll enjoy it. You'll be very excited when season three comes, who knows, a few weeks from now. Season three is so good. I hear from people. <laughs> I hear in my ears from the preview when copies that Brian sent me. Yeah, yeah. But no, it really is. I'm not even kidding. All right. Well, a special thank you also to Baloo, who is one of our top lifetime supporters of DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Baloo. Yay! Yeah, no, that's, a, that's awesome. You could be the next person like Baloo. Uh, go sign up right now, patreon.com slash DTNS. In fact, we just had uh, one of the first shipments of the new loyalty merch. If you stay a patron, every three months you stay a patron at that level, uh, you get a new thing. And it's a different thing every three months now. Uh, so you might get a mug, you might get a hoodie, you might get a sticker. Uh, it depends what how long you've been going in a row and what level you're at. And they all feature art from Len Peralta, uh, our special ninth year anniversary art, because uh, we we finished our ninth year at the end of last year. So go check it out, patreon.com slash DTNS. Stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. The talk doesn't stop here if you're a patron. You you can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Rob Dunwood and the aforementioned Len Peralta. Talk to you then. 
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>